G'day everyone and welcome to the week 7 lecture for Laws 11062 Contracts B. My name is Anthony Marinak <coughs> and this week we start on our, the final part of our journey through the, uh, the joy that is contracts law. You'll be terribly upset to know that we are getting closer and closer and closer to the end. And uh, very soon um, it will be time to bid adieu to contract law and move on into other learning areas in your degree. But we've still got a little bit of learning ahead of us. We start tonight, we start today, if you happen to be listening during the daytime, um, we start by looking at uh, different methods of termination of the contract. So we've dealt with how contracts are formed. We did that right back at the start of contract A. Then we've dealt with how to interpret contracts, which we did towards the end of contract A. At the start of contract B, we've looked at the vitiation of contracts. And now that we're coming towards the end of the program, we look at what happens when contracts end. This week, we're going to be looking at how contracts end when they are terminated either by performance or by agreement. So we're going to start with termination by performance, which is surprisingly a lot more complicated than people might expect because it sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? You perform the requirements under the contract and then the contract is over. It's terminated. It's been completed. Uh, it is a little bit more complicated than that. We'll start out by talking about what we call the doctrine of exact performance, which is set out in a rule established in a case called Cutter and Powell. So we'll start with Cutter and Powell and the doctrine of exact performance, and then we'll start looking at the exceptions to the rule in Cutter and Powell, which will show how contracts can be uh, completed by performance, <clears throat> even if they don't necessarily meet the requirements of Cutter and Powell. And then at the end of the uh, lecture, we'll look at the means by which parties can simply agree to end a contract. And there are five different ways in which that can happen, and we'll go and have a look at all five. So uh, that's relatively simple. So let's jump into this, this final stage in our uh, examination of contract law. We start, as I mentioned a moment ago, with this beast called the doctrine of exact performance. Now, exact performance is a pretty simple concept when you think about it initially. You see, we've got obligations under the contract. We know that we've got obligations under a contract because that's what we talked about right back when we started looking at formation. We talked about offer and acceptance and the notion that parties had to be ad idem. And then we said that the contract had to be certain and complete. <clears throat> and the reason the contract had to be certain and complete was so that the parties would know what their obligations were. Now, if you know what your obligations are and you carry them out exactly, you carry them out completely and to the letter, well, there can really be no question, can there, that you have satisfied the requirements of the contract. You have completed your contract with full and exact performance and therefore uh, the contract will be ended as soon as both parties have completed their obligations. Now, the rule in Cutter and Powell was a little more complicated than that. The rule in Cutter and Powell is focused on what we refer to as entire contracts. Now, an entire contract is a contract in which one party has to complete all of their obligations in order to be entitled to anything from the other party at all. And Cutter and Powell itself is a really great example that lets you understand how this works. See, what happened with Cutter and Powell? This is a case, a very old case. Now, this is a case that was from 1795. And it's reported in uh, Volume 101 of the English Reports at page 573. And I won't give the, uh, the nominant case reference for that. You can go and have a look for it if you really so desire. Um, now, Cutter was a, a sailor, and he took a position of second mate. Second mate is a, a pretty senior sailing position on one of those sailing vessels back in the late 18th century. And he took that position for an eight-week journey from Jamaica to Liverpool, and for that salary, he would have been paid 30 guineas. Now, 
a guinea was a little bit more than a pound so 30 pounds and uh, let me tell you 30 pounds in 1795 that was a pretty handsome wage that was uh, that was for, for someone of the lower classes of England that was quite easily a good year's work in those eight weeks so um, uh, <clears throat> he um, was very happy to take up that contract and the nature of the contract was such that he had to complete the journey complete the journey from Jamaica to Liverpool in order to be paid so in other words the captain is saying if you act as my second mate on the voyage from Jamaica to Liverpool then when we arrive in Liverpool you will be entitled to a payment of 30 guineas so they set off and somewhere along the line unfortunately poor Cutter died now the administrators of Cutter's estate well they wanted to get at least some of the earnings they wanted and they said okay he didn't make it all the way to Liverpool so clearly you might not want to pay the full 30 guineas because someone else had to step up and do the job of second mate however he did for at least part of the journey complete the obligation and it's not as though he somehow walked away or just ceased to perform his obligations so surely he should be entitled to some level of payment now Powell of course the master of the ship said no hang on that, that wasn't a deal the deal was that he had to complete the journey from Jamaica to Liverpool if he didn't complete the journey from Jamaica to Liverpool then I don't have to pay him diddly squat I'm not sure the English reports actually use the term diddly squat but you take my meaning now the courts well the courts agreed with Powell the courts said effectively look Cutter made a bad bargain here made a poor bargain but the nature of the contract was such that the shipmaster's obligations did not materialize they did not happen they did not exist until such time until such time as they reached Liverpool Cutter never reached Liverpool so the debt never fell due as a result this was an entire contract you can see that Cutter's entire obligation had to be performed before Powell had any obligations at all now this doesn't seem terribly fair does it it doesn't seem terribly fair that someone can perform virtually all of their obligations and still not be entitled to anything in return that, that really just doesn't quite seem right does it well the law agrees and so since the doctrine of exact performance was established in Cutter and Powell the law has created a number of exceptions and these exceptions to the do to the rule in Cutter and Powell um, these uh, these make a great deal of difference to the, the the way in which the rule operates and to its potential for operating with unfairness there's six of them let's have a look at them the first one relates to contracts which are severable or divisible so if the contract is to perform one action a hundred times and the party performs that action only 75 times well then that would seem to be divisible wouldn't it because it was you would seem to say well the obligation could be divided into a hundred repetitions and well therefore the counter obligation also ought to be divided into a hundred repetitions and therefore if you were going to pay a thousand dollars overall for that it might be fair for you to pay seven hundred and fifty dollars for the work that was actually done now that works do you see because the obligations are severable however there are certain of, of, uh, occasions on which the obligations might not be severable see what if I said to you if you mow my lawn 50 times once a week for a year 
then at the end of those 50 times, if you've mowed my lawn 50 times, I'll give you my car. Because it's getting a bit old and I'm about to salary package a new one. So you mow my lawn 50 times and I'll give you a car. Is that a contract? Yes, absolutely. Is it an entire contract? Yes, it is, because the 50, the 50 uh, lots of mowing the lawn have to be completed before I have an obligation to give up the car. <coughs> is it severable? Well, no, it's not. It's not severable, because if you only mow my car, if you only mow my, mow my car, if you only mow the lawn 30 times out of 50, well, I can't give you 60% of a car, can I? I have to either give you 100% of my obli uh, obligation or nothing, which means that you too have to either give 100% or nothing. But where a contract can be severed, where it can be divided up, that's what the court will do as an exception to the rule in Carter and Powell. Second exception is a bit of Latin. And those of you who've been studying with me for a while know that I hate legal Latin, but sometimes you've got to use it. This is one of those times. De minimis non curat lex means the law will not concern itself with trifles. And, and because I just can't help using the same joke over and over and over again, I have included a picture there of, uh, of a trifle, a rather lovely looking raspberry trifle by the look of it. The law does not concern itself with trifles. What does that mean in the context of contract law? Well, let's say that you and I had made this deal. You're going to mow my lawn 50 times, and in return for mowing my lawn 50 times, I'm going to give you the car. And let's say that on the 49th time, you mow my front lawn. You forget to mow the back lawn. You're just having one of those days and you mow the front lawn. The mower runs out of fuel just at the end of the front lawn. And you're just not thinking straight, so you go and put the mower away and go off and think you've, you've finished the job. And I turned around and say, well, hang on. Hang on. You're supposed to mow the lawn 50 times and you've mowed the lawn 49 and a half times because one of those times you only mowed the front and you didn't mow the back. And so I don't need to give you my car. Can you see how the failed obligation there is really trifling? The failed obligation there makes it look rather like what I'm doing is seizing upon a tiny little loophole to try and get out of what is really a proper obligation. The court's not going to support that. The court's going to say, look, we're not interested in trifles. You're not going to be able to rely on a trifling, a nonsensically small breach of obligation to say, oh, well, that means I don't have my obligation to it to complete. Third exception. This one's called part performance. The rule was established in a case called Sumter and Hedges. Now, this is an 1898 case reported in the first volume of the Queen's Bench Reports for that year starting at page 673. Now, if you accept part performance of the contract, you can hardly turn around after that and go back and say, well, no, actually, I've decided I want to sue you for it anyway. So, let's say you're mowing my lawn and you come to me in the middle of the year, so around about June, and you say, look, Anthony, I'm going away for a couple of weeks in August. Would you mind, because I'll be away, would you mind if I don't mow your lawn for those couple of weeks in August? Can we say, can we change the contract at this point and say, look, um, we'll turn it into a deal where it's 48 lots of mowing in return for the car? And I turn around to you and say, no, look, let's not bother changing the contract. That's a bit much effort. I'll, I'll just agree. I'll just say, okay, 48 is fine. So you think that's great? You take off on your holiday in August, you come to the end of the year and you say, well, Anthony, 
We finished the contract. I'm really looking forward to getting my car. And I say to you, no, hang on. You only mowed the lawn 48 times, you're not getting the car. It's not really a fair thing for me to do, is it? Because I've agreed along the way to accept part performance. Now the court will enforce that. If we have a look at Sumter and Hedges, which is the key case for this exception, what happened here was that there was a building project. It was building stables, because uh, horses, of course, were a key mode of transport back in the late 19th century. And um, the builder didn't, didn't complete the contract. He basically ran out of cash. Couldn't keep paying his workers, so he was unable to complete the contract. And so the landowner said, well, they haven't been able to complete the contract, but here's all the building materials. He said, bugger this, I'm just going to complete it myself. And he did. But then, of course, he sued for damages because he shouldn't have had to do all that work himself. He had made a contract, after all. And uh, what happened then was that Sumter said, well, hang on, I don't think I should have to pay because you've accepted... Sorry, I don't think I should have to, to pay you any damages because you've accepted my part performance. You've said... Essentially, part performance is fine. And you've accepted it by using those materials to complete the job. Ingenious argument, really. But it was never going to wash, and it didn't wash with the court. The court said, no, that's not how it works here. There is no acceptance of part performance. You left the landowner in a situation where they didn't have any stables, they didn't have anywhere to put their horses, and so it was a perfectly reasonable thing for them to do to complete the project. So you can see how part performance works. If someone voluntarily accepts part performance, that's going to be good enough to discharge the obligation under the contract. Substantial performance. Do you remember way back when, in Contracts A, and again earlier in Contracts B, We've been talking a lot about conditions, warranties, and intermediate terms. Now, if you haven't picked up a little bit about those three by now, then I really am a terrible contracts teacher. The idea, of course, is that conditions, conditions are terms of the contract which, if you breach them, they entitle the other side to terminate. Warranties are, con are terms of the contract which, if they are breached, will entitle the other party to damages. Intermediate terms sometimes act like conditions and they sometimes act like warranties. That's why they're intermediate. Now, the doctrine of substantial performance looks at a contract and says, you know what? If the contract has been substantially performed, that is, if uh, all of the conditions of the contract have been performed, but maybe there's a warranty or two that's a little bit out of kilter, well then it doesn't seem very reasonable at that point to allow the uh, innocent party to get out of their obligations altogether. That doesn't seem very reasonable because if a, a, if a uh, term had been that important, then it should have been made into a condition and not left as a warranty. So in that case, the court is quite likely to say, no, we're not going to allow the obligation to go away completely. We're going to enforce the other party's obligation, but then we're also going to give them an entitlement to damages. This is what happened in Honigan Isaacs. Now, Honigan Isaacs uh, is another English case. This is a 1952 case reported in the second volume for that year of the All England Reports uh, at page 176. Now, you'll all remember that the All England Reports is one of the unofficial reports series. Um, for English cases. Now, Honig in this case, um, it was an interior decorator. Contract price of $750, $400 in part payments have been made along the way. The job wasn't done completely. The job was done defectively. The defects could be fixed for about £50. Pounds. Isaacs, however, said, you haven't completed the job. Therefore, I'm not paying you any of the £350 that I'm owed. No, sorry, that I owe you. 
Now you can see the problem here pretty much straight away, can't you? That it's not really fair to deny someone £350 worth of payments because they have left 50, a £50 hole um, in the project. And what the court said was you do have to pay the £350, but then you're entitled to a set-off, so you're entitled to £50 damages back. Substantial performance makes a lot of sense. Then we get to obstruction. Now, obstruction also makes a lot of sense. If you prevent someone, you prevent someone from completing their side of the bargain, well, you can hardly then sue them for failing to complete their side of the bargain because it's not really them that's failed to do the job, it's you. Planch and Colburn is the case that I teach here. This is an 1831 case reported in volume 172 of the English reports at page 876. Planch was contracted to write all about armour, medieval armour and knights and stuff like that for a, um, a series of children's books. But <clears throat> when he was halfway through the job, the series of children's books was abandoned. So he was unable to complete his side of the bargain because he couldn't submit the book for publication because they were no longer publishing the uh, series of publications that it was going to be a part of. But he put in all this effort. When he was told, look, the, the, the uh, particular series is not going to run, you may as well stop. He looked at it and thought, but I've done all this research. I've gone on expeditions to talk to experts. Surely I should get something back for that. He asked for something and they said, well, no, you're not entitled to anything. You haven't completed the contract. You haven't written the book. And there's no point you writing the book because you can't submit it because we're not publishing it. Can you see how the publishers have prevented Planch from being able to complete his side of the bargain? They planned sued and obtained what's called a quantum meruit. Another one of those horrible Latin phrases. A quantum meruit is a payment for effort that you've put in. So the court said, look, you've done about half of the effort, so we'll give you about half of what you should have been paid. So the court made an award in that case of £50 out of the £100. So... The bottom line that we get from Planch and Colburn is if you're the cause, if you're the cause of someone not being able to complete their obligation, well then you can't really sue them as a result and you can't really avoid paying them at least some of your obligation. Finally, we come to the issue of time. Now, time is the last of these exceptions and time is really quite weird. Because the question we have to ask at the start when we're considering time is, is time of the essence? And what does that mean? What do we mean when we say is time of the essence? Well, we've talked a little bit about this before, particularly when we were looking at uh, some issues in contracts A. It's not unusual for contracts to have a deadline. But some deadlines will matter more than others. The example that I've given is a taxi ride. Now, if you have or make arrangements, you make a contract with a taxi driver that you need to be at a certain place by 6 p.m. The effect of being 10 seconds late might be nothing, and it might be dramatic. If you need to be there by 6 p.m. because you need to catch a boat that's about to sail from the harbour, being even a few seconds late might be enough that you miss the boat. Time would be of the essence. On the other hand, if you're getting a taxi cab to meet friends at the pub, being 10 seconds late is going to be such a minor irritation that it won't be worth considering at all. So you can see the time is, is it's almost the classic intermediate term because in some ways it can be breached and the breach of time can have massive implications for the rest of the contract. 
In other ways, it can be breached and not matter at all. So the question is always going to be, is time of the essence in the contract? And what happens is that many contracts these days actually state whether time is of the essence or not. And uh, if time is of the essence, then it becomes a condition of the contract. If time is not of the essence, then it's essentially a warranty. Now, it doesn't have to be stated in the contract. It might be plainly obvious from the facts whether or not time is of the essence in relation to a particular obligation. But obviously, if it's stated in the contract, then everyone's on notice and that makes things uh, quite a lot easier. Now, if time is of the essence, if time is a condition, well, then a failure to meet that condition will entitle the other party to terminate. On the other hand, if time is acting like a warranty, well, then the only remedy that's going to be available to the innocent party in those circumstances will be damages, if that. It may well be that not even damages are appropriate. So that's the issues of performance. Now we come to termination by agreement. I'm really sorry about the dialect photo, but I couldn't resist. I, had, I was writing this material and I had this picture of my mind of uh, all of the dialects rolling around going exterminate, exterminate, and then one contract law dialect just instead of rolling around going exterminate, he's rolling around going terminate, terminate, terminate. But, but maybe that's just my sick and twisted sense of humour. Let's look at termination. Now, it makes sense, doesn't it, that if two parties can agree to commence a contract, they also ought to be able to agree to terminate. Because the contract, we know from classical contract theory, the contract is a creature that's created between the two parties. So if it's theirs, if it's their contract, if it's their invention, well, then they should be able to stop it whenever they like as well. That just makes sense. The law looks for a few signals to tell whether parties have actually terminated a contract or not. The first thing the law does, and this will be no surprise to any of you, the first thing the law does is it looks to the contract. It says, what does the contract say? Does the contract set out circumstances under which the contract may be terminated? Now, we've seen an example of this already, and I talk about this example in the notes, and that's the case uh, of uh, Amman Aviation. Um, Commonwealth and Amman Aviation... 1992 case reported in volume 174 of the Commonwealth Law Reports, commencing on page 64. Now, that contract included a method of termination. The problem was the Commonwealth didn't follow it, and that's why the Commonwealth's attempt to uh, terminate that contract was unsuccessful. So if the contract itself sets out a means of termination, as long as the parties follow that, the termination will be successful. There's another couple of things you can look for in a contract which will also successfully terminate. The first of these is called a conditioned precedent. Now, a conditioned precedent is something which must happen in order for the, the uh, contract to continue. The classic conditioned precedent is a real estate deal that's subject to finance. If the finance falls through, if the finance is knocked back, well, then the rest of the deal falls through as well. Okay, so that's termination as a result of the failure of a conditioned precedent. The opposite of a conditioned precedent is a conditioned subsequent. Now, a conditioned subsequent is quite different because a conditioned precedent prevents condi uh, prevents obligations from starting at all. With a condition subsequent, the obligations are there, the obligations are fine. But what happens then is the condition subsequent comes along and knocks them out. So a condition subsequent is something which happens later on and brings an end to the contract. Now, it's really important that you be able to identify the difference between the two of these. And I would really encourage you to have a look at the written notes and the uh, very simple contract that I've put together there between um, Nicole and Mitchell, where Nicole is teaching Mitchell how to drive 
a motor vehicle. That includes both a condition precedent and a condition subsequent, and you'll be able to very clearly see the difference of the, between the two. For our purposes at the moment, in terms of this uh, um, audio-visual lecture, we just want to understand that a condition precedent needs to occur in order for obligations to be there at all. On the other hand, the obligations, if they're there, then they might be knocked out subsequently by a condition subsequent. How else can parties agree to terminate? You couldn't have, it, sorry, but you just could not have a lecture about termination without the terminator. That just doesn't make sense. Termination by substitution. Termination by substitution is where an old contract is set aside and a new contract is put in its place. Now, one of the things that I've said in the notes there, to be a little bit provocative, I've asked the question, well, is this really, is this really a new type of termination? Or are we just talking really here about termination by agreement and then the establishment of a new contract? In many cases, that's what we will be talking about. However, it might be, it might be that um, the consideration for entry into the second contract might be release of obligations under the first contract. So if there's that link between the two of them, then we'd really be talking about termination by substitution. But look, that's getting a little bit complicated. For our purposes, all we really need to think about is the fact that termination by substitution occurs when the two parties say, right, we agree to set aside the first contract and then implement the second one in its case. Finally, we get to termination by accord. Termination by accord, also very simple. This occurs when the parties simply agree to end the contract. They say, we're done. That's enough. If the parties agree to do that, and it's clear that they've agreed to do that, well, then they can't subsequently try to enforce any of those obligations. The obligations are over. They're done with. they finish finished with the contract. So that's termination by agreement. And that brings us to the end of topic seven. So we started out this topic by having a look at uh, exact performance, the rule in Cutter and Powell. And then we looked at this, the, uh, the uh, exceptions to the rule, severance, de minimis, part performance, substantial performance, and obstruction. And we looked at the sixth exception, which relates to time and whether time is of the essence or whether time is not of the essence. We then moved on and had a look at uh, the um, um, termination of contracts by agreement. We looked at the fact that the contract itself might set out the way in which a, uh, the contract can be terminated and that common ways of doing that are by recognising either a condition precedent, which must occur in order to create the obligations at all, or a condition subsequent, which if it occurs will knock out any obligations which were in place up until that point. Beyond that, we said that the parties can terminate a contract by substitution or they can simply agree to end the contract. So that's what we looked at uh, this week in the uh, week seven materials in terms of termination. Um, next week, we're going to go on and have a look at uh, frustration as a way of terminating contracts. Following our week on frustration, we'll have a look at breach and that'll segue us neatly into a discussion about remedies. So uh, that's it for this lecture. Have a great week. See you around on Moodle and uh, I'll see you for a very frustrating lecture next week.